Well, um, the shortest book in, in the whole Bible is the uh, Epistle of Jude. Um, it's about half a page. And that little, that little book, Jude, written whatever, 1800 years after the time of Moses, uh, lets us know, for instance, that there was actually a fight, a dispute over the body of Moses. Isn't that interesting? Um, Moses went up onto to, uh, Mount Sinai and he saw the promised land. He's 80 years old and he makes it as far as the promised land but never enters it. The 12 tribes of the Jews crossed the Jordan into the promised land and there on Mount Nebo, Moses died and was buried. And no one knows to this day where he was buried. However, the epistle of Jude that I mentioned, the half page in the New Testament, gives us a clue. Uh, it's talking about uncontrollable language, cursing, swearing, uncontrollable language. And it says, it says in there that not even Michael the archangel when he was disputing with the devil over the body of Moses, dared to denounce him in the language of abuse. All he said to him was, may God rebuke you. So we know there was a fight over the body of Moses and that nobody knows to this day where he was buried. So you and I know, however, that uh, Moses is more than alive and well. And you say, well, how do we know that? Um, the week before Jesus passed over on the cross from, earth, from Calvary to heaven, the week before that, Moses and Elijah showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration to discuss with Jesus what was going to happen in Jerusalem a few days later. So we know Moses is alive. And Elijah, who went up in the fiery chariot, is alive. Long introduction, I want to talk about the letter of James. Sometimes I get wandering all over the place. The letter of James, he was the first bishop of Jerusalem. He was the first Catholic priest in a Catholic parish in Jerusalem. So we're talking about, you know, whatever, almost 2,000 years ago. And James, me being a, a parish priest myself, living at the end of the ages, uh, James has influenced me more for, from, from a practical point of view of, of in living the gospel of Christ and following Christ. So jumping right in here, um, James is writing to the Jews of the dispersion. Now, what does that mean? He's writing to the Jews, the 12 tribes of the Jews who are scattered all over Europe, all over the Roman Empire, into Africa, perhaps into Russia. He's writing to them from the first parish in Jerusalem. And so he says, greetings to the 12 tribes of the dispersion scattered around the world. And um, then he said to them and to us, my brothers, you will always have your trials, always. Try to treat them as a happy privilege. You understand that your faith is only put to the test to make you patient. But patience too is to have its practical results so that you will become fully developed, complete and nothing missing. So we always have our trials. I have mine, you have yours. Even though I'm following Christ, I have trials in my life. Then he gets down to this. This is where he began to uh, change me. Uh, if there's any one of you, okay, anybody here on, on Facebook with us, living in Russia, living in Dublin, Ireland, living in South America, if any one of you needs wisdom, you must ask God for it. 
who gives to all freely and ungrudgingly, it will be given to him. Extraordinary statement. Ask God for wisdom. He gives to all freely and ungrudgingly. It will be given to you. But, but, uh, he must ask with faith, whatever that is. Because the devil believes in God and in Christ. But he, James said, but you must ask with faith and no trace of doubt. Because a person who has doubts is like the waves thrown up in the sea when the wind drives. That sort of person in two minds wavering between going different ways must not expect that the Lord will give him anything. So if I want wisdom, I must ask for it in a single-minded manner and be persistent. Like, for instance, if you say, for instance, on a given day like today, okay, I heard the priest, Lord God, I want you to give me the gift of wisdom. And then that night, you forget what you've asked for. The Lord will give you nothing. So when you approach, you must ask with faith and no trace of doubt and, and be persistent in asking and ask for it constantly, even on a daily basis, that God will give you wisdom. Would you like a practical example? The third king of the Jews, Solomon, the first being Saul, the second being David. Um, Solomon, Solomon the wise, although I have to admit at the end of his life, he seems to have been an old fool. He, he uh, built pagan temples for his many wives. But in his earlier, earlier on, uh, Samson or uh, Solomon is asleep, if you don't mind, while everybody sleeps. And the Lord God appeared to him in a dream. God speaks in visions, he speaks in dreams. You remember Joseph in the Old Testament was a dreamer. Joseph, who married Mary, was a dreamer. God spoke to them in dreams. God speaks to Solomon in a dream. And he, he says to Solomon, ask of me what you will, and I give it to you. I'd ask you to be careful here. This is a very dangerous thing I'm saying to you. Ask of me what you will, and I will give it to you. The Lord God is speaking. And Solomon begins in his dream a little spiel to God. And he says to God, to the Father, to Abba, to, to, to the I Am, um, I thank you, God, that you have made me king in place of my father, David. Um, but I am just a youth. I'm a young person. And this people that you've given me is so great and so vast, who could possibly govern them? Like the people of Queen of Peace now are so great and so vast. Uh, if I was doing a census, there'd probably be 4,000 people. Who could possibly govern them? So Solomon said, who could possibly govern them? And then he said, he said, uh, he said, give your servant an understanding heart so that I may know right from wrong. Give your servant an understanding heart. He didn't ask for power or money or to win the lotto. And God was pleased with Solomon's prayer. So he said, I'll give you, he said, a heart so shrewd and so wise that none before you has had and none after you will have. And the spirit came upon Solomon all in a dream. And we talk about Solomon the wise to this day. Now on a practical level, if you want to see wisdom at work in him, uh, two women came into the presence of Solomon. Both of them had babies at the same time. Uh, one of the women had overlaid her child in her sleep and smothered it 
I presume by accident. And then she gets up during the night and switches babies. And these two women come into the presence of Solomon and every mother knows her child. You know the smell of your child. Um, so, but when she wake, woke up that morning, she had a dead child at her breast and knew the child wasn't hers. So they're fighting in the presence of King Solomon. The live baby is mine. The dead baby is yours. And the other one's saying, the dead baby is yours. You smothered it. The live one is mine. So how is a, a poor, ordinary, common man going to know this, going to solve this difficulty? So remember now, he has the gift from God, the gift of wisdom, the gift of an understanding heart. So he says, watch it in action. He said, um, bring me a sword. Cut the living child in two. Oh, you say, how horrible, how horrible. Cut the living child in two. Give half to one and half to the other. And of course, now what does that do? Well, the real mother of the child uh, cries out, no, 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 no. Give her the child. And the other one shouted, uh, no, 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 kill it. None of us will have it. Get half to one and half to the other. So there's the living example of wisdom. And here it is again now, and take this personally. If any one of you, you who are looking at this video at this moment, wants wisdom, you must ask God for it, who gives to all freely and ungrudgingly. It will be given to him, him or her. But you must ask with faith. You must believe and know and understand that God has wisdom, is wise, and will give you wisdom. No trace of doubt, because the person who has doubts is like the waves thrown in the sea when the wind drives. That sort of person in two minds, wavering between going different ways, must not expect that the Lord will give them anything. That's just five verses in James. Now, I'm probably going to finish with this, but visit James again, maybe in the next video. What happened to you, priest? Well, I got down on my knees every day for a period of 21 days and very simply prayed. I said, Lord, like Solomon, I'm begging you to give me an understanding heart, to give me the gift of wisdom. And I also said, if you don't give it to me, you're not there. That's how desperate I was. So if anybody wants wisdom, let him ask God for it, but let him ask with faith and persistence that you want wisdom. And um, this happened, I can only tell you how it happened. My prayer was answered. You say, well, I don't think you're very wise. Well, it doesn't much matter what any of us thinks, but my prayer was answered. And it continues to be answered uh, down through the past uh, 45 years. I am giving an, I have an understanding heart. I understand things. So on the 21st day of my prayer, uh, as God is my witness and he is, um, a very heavy set man walked up to me outside church, Divine Mercy in Merritt Island, Florida big thick glasses, like the old Coke bottles, never saw him before, haven't seen him since. And he walked up to me and he said, priest, there's no record in the New Testament part of the Bible of a woman betraying Christ. And he simply walked off. And all I can tell you is something opened up. And I knew immediately but even though all the men ran away, um, the women stood beneath the cross of Christ. The women washed his body and prepared it for burial. The women were the first witnesses of the resurrection. Elizabeth said yes to God and John the Baptist was born. Mary, the crowning glory of all free women, said yes to God. 
and the Christ was born. And you see this woman, Mary, at the wedding feast of Cana approaching Jesus. They have no more wine. And Jesus turning water into wine. Um, in a short time later, Jesus would turn wine into his blood. And the night before he died, seated at table with the eleven, Judas has gone as far as I know to betray him. Uh, Jesus takes bread. Take this all of you and eat it for this is my body. My body. The person of Christ present in the piece of bread. And take this all of you and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood. The marriage cup. So when, when you go to your Sunday Mass, as you do from time to time, and you're told, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body. You're receiving the person of Jesus Christ under the appearances of a piece of bread. And if, if you know, the priest represents you at the altar, um, that when he says, take this, all of you, and drink from this, the cup of my blood, the blood of the new covenant, the new marriage, that when we receive communion, either under the appearances of a piece of bread or under the appearances of wine, uh, we are receiving the person of Christ. We are consummating our union with Christ. He's the bridegroom, the church is the bride, and I'm done for now. So it's James uh, chapter 1, um, verse 5 through 6.